Well, it's a pleasure to be here. I would like to uh, thank the organizers for inviting me to talk to you today. My talk is going to be highly non-technical, so I'm not going to refer to Python, I'm not going to refer to R, I tend to be more an R person than a Python person, right? Don't blame me for that. It's going to be mostly, I know, I know. Anyway, I prefer Adobe Illustrator, actually. That's a wonderful tool. Anyway, so the talk is not about tools. The talk is about concepts, ideas, right? What comes before we use any of those tools, and it is a talk about charts, and more in particular about how charts mislead, and moreover, how we mislead ourselves when we see charts, and what we can do about it. The talk that you're, <clears throat> the talk that you're about to see is sort of a trailer for a book that I'm publishing this year in the fall of 2019. This is not available yet, right? but it's going to be published by W.W. W. Norton, which is a, a, a general publisher, in the fall this year, and the title is How Charts Lie, Getting Smarter About visual information, which is basically a book teaching the general public, any sort of reader, non-technical reader, how to approach charts, graphs, maps, etc., and how to interpret them correctly, how to avoid the most common kinds of misunderstandings that we stumble upon whenever we see a chart. So I'm going to give you sort of a preview, a very quick overview of what those, what those things are. A little bit about my background, I am a journalist by training. I have no formal training in statistics or in data science or even in data visualization. I am self-taught in all these areas. I began my career in Spain back in 1997. I'm originally from Spain, creating infographics, which are pictorial explanations of information, right? An accident happened somewhere, and you do a 3D model describing how the accident happened and things like that. I used to produce that kind of work. And then later on, when I moved to the United States first and then to Brazil for a few years, I started getting interested in data science and statistics, and more in particular, in data visualization. And that's what I teach at the University of Miami. A little bit about what data visualization is about. That's very, very important to understand in order to understand how charts lie, right? So the first thing to understand about data visualization is that data visualization is based on the idea, on the notion of visual encoding. When you create a visual, uh, a visual representation of data, what you do is to transform those numbers that you have in your data set into objects, or you map those numbers onto objects. And, that, and we usually call those objects geoms in the language of ggplot and other software tools that we use, right? But then what we do is to vary certain features of those objects in proportion to the numbers that we're trying to represent, right? So if you, for example, begin with five or six numbers and you map those numbers onto several rectangles and then you vary the length or the height of those rectangles, what you're creating is a bar graph, right? If you map numbers on two axes, and you map them using little dots, and then the method of encoding that you use is the position of those dots over those two axes, you will be creating a scatter plot, right? So this is the language that we use in data visualization, the language of geoms and the language of visual encoding. And one thing that we know is that this language, this grammar of graphics, is very, very powerful. It is very powerful both for exploring data, and it is also extremely powerful to describe that data or communicate that data to others. The reason why that happens is that we human beings have a very, very hard time understanding large amounts of numbers, right? So if I show you that data set over here, even if I describe what these numbers are, you will not be able to extract patterns and trends from those data, right? This is a data set, a real data set of global temperatures from the year 1000 up to the year 2000, measured in Celsius degrees in comparison to the average, to an average of the 20th century, the average temperature between 1961 and 1980, right? That's the reason why you see negative numbers and positive values below that average or above that average, right? Now, a data visualization is a means to extract meaning from data and to answer questions from those data. So if I ask you, if the data set comes back, right? Imagine that you have the, uh, the data in front of you. 
If I ask you, have global temperatures increased or decreased in the past 1,000 years, you will, unless that you know the answer to that question already, you will not be able to answer that question through the data alone. Moreover, if I ask you, has in the past global temperatures been higher than they have been today in the past 1,000 years? That's a very difficult question to answer, taking a look at the numbers alone, right? But when we transform those numbers into some sort of chart, when we map those numbers onto objects, right? For example, if we transform those numbers into some sort of line chart, mapping those numbers onto an object, suddenly the patterns and trends that existed behind the data become obvious, right? This is a very famous, very popular, and very influential data visualization, probably one of the most influential data visualizations created in the 20th century. It is commonly called the hockey stick chart because it has the shape of a hockey stick. There is an entire book describing the, uh, how this uh, uh, graphic was created. The title of that book, and I'm going to be recommending tons of books today, the title of that book is The Hockey Stick and the Climate climate wars, because after the chart was published, it created a lot of controversy in the public discussion here in the United States. The chart shows you the data points, right? the estimates of temperatures. These are, actual, these are estimates of temperatures, because obviously we don't have records of temperatures from the year 1000, right? So climate scientists reconstruct those temperatures, and those are the point estimates. Then we have actual records of temperatures. This is the red line. And then the line that you have over here, obviously, is the smooth, basically sort of the average direction of the data, right, using non-technical language. And the chart also shows you the level of uncertainty around those data points. Basically, what we are doing is, in a very small space, in a very, very small space, we are condensing, we are very concisely describing what those thousands of numbers that we had before in the data set reveal. They don't reveal that if we present those numbers alone. We only can see the stories, the insights that hid behind those numbers when we represent them graphically. The power of data visualization, I think, explains that is becoming a language that has been widely adopted in many different realms. Obviously, in the realm of data science, statistics, the sciences in general, but also the realm where I come from, the realm of journalism, right? If you follow the New York Times, the Washington Post, the National Geographic, the Wall Street Journal, and many other publications here in the United States and abroad, you may have observed in the last 10 years or so that the number of data visualizations that they publish has increased quite a lot, almost exponentially, right? It has increased very, very very much. Well, the reason why that happens, right, uh, data visualization appear more in The Economist or The New York Times and other publications is that through their analytics, these news organizations are seeing that data visualizations are popular. People really like to see maps and data charts and data graphs. Actually, some of the most popular stories ever published by some of these news organizations are not written stories, are not videos. They are data visualizations. The most popular piece of content ever published by the New York Times online is a data visualization, a data visualization commonly called the a dialect map. The title of the, of the piece is How You All Use and You Guys Talk. I'm not going to show this piece. You can go online and find it. But basically what this piece does is to ask you several questions about how you pronounce certain things in English, how you say certain things in English, and based on your responses to the questions that you're asked, the map will show more or less where you probably live. And apparently, if you are a native English speaker from the United States, once you get to the end of the questionnaire that the tool presents to you, it, the tool will basically pinpoint exactly where you live based on the dialect that you speak. This is the most popular piece of content ever published by the New York Times.com, and it's a data visualization. I am a great believer, thanks to this expansion, to this new, new golden age of data visualization that we are seeing not only in technical fields or in scientific fields, but also in the public conversation, in uh, news publications, that there's a lot of potential, there's a lot of promise in this expansion of data visualization. I'm a great believer in the fact that data visualizations, charts, right, I use those two terms 
indistinctively. Data visualizations can enable conversations. When a data visualization is well designed, well done, honestly designed, presents good data, etc., it can enable meaningful conversations about important topics. But in order for that to happen, that chart also needs to be well understood. So there is a dual responsibility. There is a responsibility on the part of people who design charts and present those charts to the public, but there is also a responsibility on the part of the public to make the effort to understand those charts correctly, right? And to read them correctly. Unfortunately, throughout my careers, I, talking to journalists, designers, data scientists, etc., I have observed that generally, people don't really understand what charts are about and how charts should be approached. I'm going to show to you several misconceptions that I have heard talk to me or spoken to me over and over and over and over again throughout my career. There are three myths that I believe that we need to abandon when we discuss data visualizations or charts. The first one is, a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, that's not true. And I will show that to you later on. Visualizations is intuitive. Charts are intuitive, right? I take a look at this chart, I understand the story immediately. That is very dangerous and very, very misleading. And the last one, the data should speak for itself. I don't need anything else, right? I should see the numbers, I interpret it correctly. All those things or all those sentences are myths and they are only true if we append an extension to those sentences, which is a picture is worth a thousand words, visualization can be intuitive, and the data should speak for itself only if you know how to read it. And the danger is that many, many people that see charts on a regular basis, and that includes people with a technical background, don't know how to read charts correctly. We believe we do, because we think that charts are like illustrations, they are like just pictures, right? And they are not, right? Charts are visual arguments. In order to be understood correctly, they cannot just be seen. They need to be read, right? They need to be read as we read any piece of text. So abandoning these misconceptions is related to understanding several challenges or several biases that are related to how charts are created and how charts are read. The first one is paternicity. Now, this is a very, very important concept to understand. What is paternicity? Paternicity basically means, and by the way, paternicity is a, is a term that I borrow from this wonderful book, The Believing Brain, by Michael, Michael Shermer, who is a psychologist. <coughs> paternicity basically means that we human brains have evolved to see patterns naturally in the real world and to basically overimpose meaning to those patterns. That's a very important trait. It's a trait that we evolve because it ha it's helpful for survival. But sometimes it can misfire. And it can, mis it can misfire very easily and very, very dangerously sometimes. For example, take a look at these charts that you have over here. They're not very beautiful, right? Let's suppose these are completely you know, meaningless, but let's assume that this is, for example, I don't know, the unemployment rate of nine different countries over the years, obviously the, the, the unemployment rate doesn't vary that widely, right? But let's suppose that it does, right? Country one, country two, country three, country four, country five, five, et cetera, and we have the unemployment rate over there, right? Now, if you take a look at those charts, I can, for long, for, you know, for one minute or two minutes, I can assure you that your brains will start detecting patterns. Oh, the unemployment rate on country one increased over here. It also increased on country number three or in country number four. And take a look at that. They vary almost the same in these particular years. Your brains automatically, unconsciously, it starts, will start seeing connections if you stare at the chart long enough. Unfortunately, obviously, this is a chart that I randomly created with a little R script in order to generate, generate basically nine random charts. But still, even if those patterns that, are, that, that the charts sort of reveal are completely random, our brains will start detecting them automatically and unconsciously. Why is that dangerous? Because of the second challenge, narrative. Once we detect patterns in the real world, right, in data, in the data that we see, we will start seeking explanations 
for those patterns that we see in the real world. One we identify those patterns that look meaningful, right? even if they are, they, are, they are just random, our brains will automatically and immediately start looking for possible stories to tell around this data. Let me show you one of my favorite examples that comes from my wonderful book titled Teaching Statistics a Bag of Tricks. This map over here, the map that, map that you have over here, shows the counties in the United States that have the lowest rates of cancer death uh, by kidney cancer death, death rates, okay? So basically these counties that experience the lowest number of cancer deaths per 100,000 people in the United States, sir. Perfect, they are perfectly mapped over there. I'm going to give you a lot, another little piece of information that some of you may already know, all right? Which is that most of these counties are rural counties, right? Once you have those two pieces of information, your brain immediately will start making up stories, connecting those two facts, right? Low cancer rates, you know, rural counties, oh, I'm going to verbalize what a normal human brain will start doing. Well, perhaps these counties have so, such a low number of cancer, you know, cancer, cancer deaths because they are rural, and as long as they are rural, probably they have low pollution, and we know that pollution is related to a higher number of cancers. It could also be, I don't know, that people in rural counties eat better, right? Perhaps they, you know, eat organic, they grow food in their backyards or whatever, and they eat better, they eat organic, and we know that a good diet is also related to lower uh, rates of cancer. Or, or it could be perhaps that people in rural counties exercise more, right? They walk more, etc. Or perhaps it's because people in rural counties have closer ties with families, and we know that having good relationships can also lead to better health. That is not in the chart. That is something that happens here in your brain. One thing that we need to remind ourselves, even people who are well trained in statistics, is that a chart shows only what it shows and nothing else. Everything else that you see in the chart is happening here. It's not happening in the chart. Moreover, right, we could apply that principle if we take a look at the counties in the United States that have the highest, highest rates of deaths, or of a cancer death rate, okay? And those counties are all rural. What is going on over here? Well, this has nothing to do with pollution, has nothing to do with diet, has nothing to do with, you know, having good relationships with your neighbors or whatever. This is simple arithmetic, right? It's simple arithmetic. It's like we know in the statistics that, you know, small populations, all right, or small samples vary much more randomly than big populations, right? Even the way that I explain these to kids is that if you have a county in which only people, only 10 people leave, Right? And in one decade, one of those people die because of cancer, suddenly you have a, a death rate of 10%, which is a huge death rate. Then in that same county, <clears throat> the decade after, nobody dies of cancer, and suddenly you have a cancer rate of zero, right? which is a very low rate, obviously. Right? So these huge variation in small counties is the reason why you see both rural counties in both these maps. But you may, if you didn't know about this basic arithmetic fact, your brain will still make up the stories based on this data. <clears throat> this is also related to the idea of eGrafficacy, which is a very, very strange word. What is eGrafficacy? Well, it's the equivalent of illiteracy, right? <clears throat> graphicacy basically means graphical literacy, right? Graphicacy is a word that I borrowed from another book written by a cartographer <clears throat> called Mark Monmonier. The title of the book is Mapping It Out. In Mapping It Out, Monmonier says that today, in order to be an educated citizen, we need to have much more than literacy, right? the ability to read and write. Right? And I wish that educators would pay attention to books such as this one, because we also need numeracy. And numeracy is not just mathematics, and it is not just statistics. And it's not just data science. Ma numeracy is basically like a sixth sense in the back of your brain that starts ringing when you see numbers that look a little bit dubious. You don't know why that number looks dubious, but you notice unconsciously, almost in instinctively, that there is something wrong with those numbers. That nu that's numeracy at work. And connected to the idea of numeracy, you also have the notion of graphicacy, which is the ability to interpret, to read, and interpret visual representations of those numbers. 
sorry, I have not presented in a while and my voice is going, <coughs> it's going away. Anyway, so <clears throat> let me show you an example of innumeracy and e-graphicacy or ingraphicacy at work. That's a map that apparently hangs on the walls of the White House at the moment. This is a photograph that was taken by a reporter right after the 2016 presidential election. <clears throat> Someone, a White House aide, was carried, carrying a, a, a printed copy and a framed copy of that map to hang on the walls of the White House. Apparently, President Trump loves this map of the 2016 presidential election. <clears throat> and for a while, there were news reports that he had copies of that map on his desk and he handed out copies to people who went visit him in the Oval Office, right? Obviously, he's very proud of his victory, and he should be, because he won against all odds. Uh, as you probably noticed, I didn't explain that before, but just in case, the map represents <clears throat> Republican vote versus Democratic vote. Which areas of the United States voted more for the Republican candidate, and which areas of the United States voted more for the Democratic candidate, Hillary Clinton, right? Uh, so President Trump was giving these copies of this map <clears throat> to people who came visit him in the Oval Office. Um, not surprisingly, perhaps, he has also tweeted about the map. So a while ago, there was an interchange between President Trump and several supporters and people who oppose him. President Trump was trying to encourage <clears throat> people in Texas to participate in the primary elections in Texas, and he tweeted something like, um, I want to encourage all my Texas friends to participate in the primary elections. And someone who opposes President Trump replied to President Trump saying, you have no friends. <laughs> and someone, someone who supports President Trump replied to this other person saying, really? Do you think that we have no friends? Take a look at this map in Pline. Take a look at the amount of red on that map versus the amount of blue on that map, right? And President Trump <clears throat> retweeted this person saying, such a beautiful map, thank you. Well, the map, is, the map is very beautiful. I love maps. But I also believe that that particular map, if you don't know how to read it correctly, right, can be really, really misleading, regardless of whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. This works both ways, by, by, ways, by the way. The map has also appeared on book covers. There was a book that was published, an e-book published, <clears throat> right after the elections called Citizens for Trump, written by an author called Jack Posobiec. And when I saw it, I, you know, I, I, I tried to be nice to people. And when I saw it on social media, and I love maps, and I love charts, right? And I love you know, giving feedback about charts. When I saw people promoting this book in social media, I replied to people, particularly Jack Posobiec, saying, I'm not going to quote myself verbatim here, but the, the, what, the spirit of what I said was, I think that you either need to change the title of the book or to change the illustration on the cover. Because the title doesn't describe what the map is showing. And the map doesn't show what the title says, right? Because your title is Citizens for Trump. And the map is not showing citizens. The map is showing something completely different. So I'm, a, I'm aware that changing a chart may be a little bit too difficult. So perhaps what you may want to do is to change the title of your book to something that better describes what the map is really showing. Remember the whole idea behind data visualization. The idea behind data visualization is the representation of numbers through the proportional variation of a certain feature of a certain object. If you want to title your book Citizens for Clinton or Citizens for Trump, it doesn't really matter. You should not use that map because the amount of red and the amount of blue is not proportional to the number of people who voted for Trump or who voted for Clinton, right? What is the proportion of red and the proportion of blue on that map? It's 80% red and 20% blue. And the reason why that, and that obviously, indirectly, gives the idea of a victory by a landslide, probably that's the reason why President Trump likes this map so much, right? But the map is very misleading, <clears throat> very misleading. So <clears throat> the problem with this map, obviously, is that, and that the, the, the reason why there is so much red on the map is that there are huge, huge swaths of territory uh, in the United States, particularly you see, in this area over here, that are basically devoid of population. Very little people live there in the Midwest, in the middle of the country, basically. A friend of mine who is a cartographer, Ken Field, 
created an alternative map in which he tried to pinpoint every single voter in the election, and then he color-coded the voters according to whether they voted Republican or Democrat, and then tried to geolocate each one of them close to the places where they live, all right? And that's the result, and you can see again, you know, the huge areas over here that are completely empty, right? People in these areas tend to concentrate in the big, in the big cities, right? Well, I'm not as sophisticated as Ken, but if I needed to you know, write a book titled Citizens for Clinton or Citizens for Trump, again, it doesn't really matter, I would not use a map, right? I would not use a map. What I would do would be to use a chart that shows the number of citizens who voted for each one of the candidates. Perhaps a, sim a simple bar graph will show these data, right? Because we, here we have basically the, uh, the, the election was a 50-50 split. 46% for President Trump, 48% for candidate Clinton, right? That's the real number of citizens who voted for each one of the candidates. But even this chart is very misleading. Because if you want to talk, if you want to title your book Citizens for Clinton or Citizens for Trump, that graphic is not enough. Why? Because not all citizens voted in the election. If you want to title your book Citizens for Clinton, you need to show me all citizens who could have voted. Now, the problem is, though, that the largest group of voters in the United States is the people, is the people who didn't even vote. And when you take that into account, well, perhaps you will not want to title your book Citizens for Clinton or Citizens for Trump. You will need to title your book Citizens for Nobody, because that's basically <laughs> the largest group of voters. Um, and by the way, by the way, let's suppose that you win a presidential election for some reason. You run for office and you win a presidential election. Which one of these you will post on the walls of your White House? Well, I can tell you, if I ever win a presidential election myself, something that is not possible because I'm not American, right? I'm, I will be a naturalized citizen, but I cannot run for president. I can run for Congress, but not for president. Um, anyway, so that's probably a plan B for the future. But anyway, so... <clears throat> But let's suppose, just for the sake of argument, that I win a presidential election, right? And I want to celebrate my victory. Would I use that map over here to celebrate my victory? No, because that map, and this is related to the work that you do, doesn't display the metric that really matters to win a presidential election in the United States. That metric is not the popular vote. It is not the amount of territory that you control, right? This is not, you know, War of Warcraft or whatever, right? That doesn't really matter. What really matters is the amount of electoral votes that you get, right? So perhaps the graphic that should be printed out and posted on the walls of the White House should be a combination of charts that show the electoral vote, right? How many electoral votes President Trump got, or myself, if I ever win to the run for president, right? President Trump got many more electoral votes than candidate Clinton, then perhaps a map that shows the electoral vote at the national level, and then perhaps also some sort of cartogram. A cartogram is a map that distorts the areas of a region according to another metric, right? In that case, it's a map that distorts the states of the United States according to the number of electoral votes that they contribute to a presidential election. The challenge number four is the fear of complexity. This is a very, very dangerous one. We, for, in the world that I come from, the world of journalism, this is a very, very important topic that I discuss all the time. Because we journalists tend to oversimplify things. And this happens also, by the way, not only in journalists. I have also observed, uh, observed it happening also in data science and in data analytics. Right? We have this huge data set, and we try to convey what the data set uh, is saying, or the stories of the data set, through an average, for example. Well, somehow, sometimes the average is a good representation of the entire data set, but sometimes an average can be extremely, extremely misleading, right? Let me show you a chart. This chart over here, there's nothing wrong with it. It's perfectly fine. It's a chart based on the best available data that we have showing the murder rate per 100,000 people in the United States, and we all know the story, right? Murder rate increased during the 80s, came down during the 90s, and then it stayed more or, more or less the same during the 2000s. And then in the past two or three years, the murder rate has started increasing again. This is the kind of important conversation that we need to have. What can we do about that, right? And charts can help a lot with that to inform public conversations, but only if we design them correctly and only if we interpret them correctly. And this chart is very often misinterpreted because indirectly, 
it tells you the story that the United States is becoming a more dangerous country, right? And that is not true. Absolutely not true. What is the problem with this average? Not really an average, but let's call it an average, this rate, right? What is the problem with these? Well, the problem is outliers, right? Most places in the United States, right? If you go to my neighborhood here in Miami, I live in Kendall, there has been one murder in the past six years or something like that, just one in the past six years. So if I could plot my own neighborhood in 2015, by the way, we could extend this line and it will keep increasing, but let's suppose that I could plot my neighborhood over here, it would be down here probably, because the murder rate in my neighborhood is really, really small, right? And most places in the United States are down there. If we could plot every city or every town in the United States, the murder rate is very, very low. I lived in Brazil, that's murder rate, right? <laughs> that's murder rate, right? So whenever I see this kind of discussion in the use, and people use only this chart, I feel compelled to say, you cannot just show the national average. You need to discuss the role of our outliers. What is the challenge, right? That even if most places in the United States are quite safe, right, they're outliers, right? There are certain neighborhoods in big cities and mid-sized, mid, mid, middle-sized cities that are so dangerous, that have become so dangerous in the past four or five years that they basically distort the national rate, according to crime statisticians, people who know much more than I do about this, but I have read articles about it, and they say, you know, if you could plot those places in this chart, they will go through the roof. It would be impossible to put them on this scale because the murder rate is so enormous. And those outliers, basically, as in any kind of data set that contains huge outliers, they work as magnets, right? You have your line, and you have the magnet over here, and suddenly your line starts spiking up just because of the role of those outliers. The way that I usually explain this to journalists and graphic designers, the world that I come from, is that if you show only the national rate, you are misinforming people. You need to show the, the national rate, the average, so to speak. But also, you need to explain those outliers to me so I can understand what is going on, and then we can have an informed conversation about how to solve this problem, because this is a real problem. Number five, we're getting there. These are se seven challenges. Number five is confirmation, right? Once we have seen patterns, once we have found explanations to those patterns, right, we don't want to see those explanations disconfirmed or refuted. We hate that, right? There is a bias, a very well-known cognitive bias that many books describe called the confirmation bias, right? Once we form an opinion, right, forming an op opinions is much easier to abandon in opinions, right? We don't like abandoning opinions, and that is really dangerous. Particularly if those opinions are part of our ideological overview, or ideological stand to, stance toward the world. If you're interested in learning more about the confirmation bias, there are many books about it, tons of them. My favorite one is Mistake, Mistakes Were Made, but not by me, by Carol Tavris and Elliot Aronson. This is a wonderful book about cognitive bias. It's the best one that I have read, even better than Thinking About Fast and Slow and many others, although that's another wonderful book. This is my favorite one, right? Now, let me show you an example of confirmation bias, how easy it is to see a pattern, jump to conclusions, and then stick to those conclusions, right? And what we can do to abandon those conclusions. A while ago, I saw a discussion in social media about whether Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, is good or bad for the job market. I don't have an opinion about that. I'm not an economist. I'm not qualified to cast an opinion, right? What I do know a little bit about is charts, though. And I saw several commentators using the following chart to defend, on the, uh, defend the idea that Obamacare is great for the job market. Because if you take a look at the number of jobs created in the private sector in the past few years, right, we all know this curve, right? The curve went up, right? Then the, the economic crisis came, and then you know, the number of jobs created by the, uh, by the private market went down very sharply. And then we have the recovery around 2010, and the number of jobs created in the job market, in the private job market, it started increasing again, and it keeps increasing, which is great news, right? The unemployment rate in the United States right now is really, really low. It's a historical low levels. And then they say, well, you know, Obamacare is not bad for the job market because take a look at what happens very close to the place where the curve changes direction. Obamacare was passed, implying, well, Obamacare actually helps with the recovery. Well, no. A chart shows only what it shows and nothing else. The mantra that we need to repeat ourselves over and over again because otherwise our brains unconsciously will jump to conclusions. You see two events happening 
simultaneously or one after the other right, or very close to each other in time, and your brain automatically makes the causal connection between the two. We, it could have been that Obamacare is great for the job market, I don't know, right? Or it could be we could, find, we could look for alternative explanations to this change of the curve. It could be, you know, that President Obama's stimulus package, which, which passes passed over here, those billions of dollars that were injected in the, in the private market, it started affecting the economy over here, and then co private companies started, started um, hiring workers again. That's a possible alternative explanation. Again, I cannot claim that I know about that, but it's a possible alternative explanation. What I'm getting at is that whenever we see charts, we need to control our brains not to jump to conclusions and to think about alternative explanations that we could pursue or that we could explore further or, or think about counterfactuals. What would have happened if Obamacare was never passed? What about if Obamacare got killed, I don't know, by the Supreme Court, for example? How would that curve look like? I don't know. It could have looked like that, right? A more rapid recovery, I don't know. Or it could have looked like that, all right, confirming the idea that Obamacare is good for the job market, right? If the curve has looked, has looked like that. We don't know because a chart shows only what it shows, only what it shows. Number six. I'm getting to the most important ones, I think, rationalization. There is an increasing amount of literature about the difference between reasoning and rationalization. Those are two things that are related to each other, but they are very different. They are very, very different. The difference is that um, it's described in this book over here. The book is um, titled uh, The Enigma of Reason, The Enigma of Reason. And what The Enigma of Reason and other many books similar to this one, although this is my favorite one, say is that human intelligence didn't evolve to discover reality as it is. That's what not human intelligence evolved for. Humans inte human intelligence evolved to justify our own opinion to ourselves and then justify our own opinions to others so we could persuade those others to join our tribe, to join our group, and to create sort of a commonality of opinion against the other outside the group. That's what human intelligence apparently evolved for, according, evolved for, according to the theory that these kinds of uh, a, a, a researchers explain in books such as this one. Why is this so important? Because this is also related to the previous charts that I showed you before. It is important, again, because we tend to jump to conclusions. We tend to stick to those conclusions. And then we tend to reason ourselves into reinforcing those conclusions. Let's suppose, for example, that you are a cigarette smoker. I'm not a cigarette smoker, but let's suppose that I am, right? And I hear people telling me over and over again, you should stop smoking. Smoking is not good for you. You know, it's going to kill you in the long term. Uh, I'm getting there. Um, uh, it's going to kill you in the long term, blah, 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 etc., etc. But I want to keep smoking just because I like smoking. I want my opinion confirmed. Well, I'm going to show myself a chart that will confirm my idea that cigarette smoking is not that bad for me, right? It's a chart that shows you that I would, actually cigarette smoking is great for your health. There is a positive relationship between cigarette smoking per capita and life expectancy country by country. If you create a scatter plot of cigarette consumption per capita and then uh, a GDP per capita, no, life expectancy in years per person, right, you will see that, well, the relationship is not linear, obviously, it would be better described as a curve, right, but it's a positive relationship, right? The more cigarettes people consume, the more life expectancy people have. That's how people interpret this chart, but it is not the right way to verbalize what this chart is showing. This chart is not showing that the more people smoke cigarettes, the more they leave. What it is showing is that at a national level, there is a positive relationship between cigarette smoking and life expectancy, period. That's what the chart is showing. Now, why is this happening? Well, it is happening because of several biases and several you know, paradoxes that are very common in statistics. The first one is the ecological fallacy. I made an individual conjecture, an indiv I got an individual insight, something that applies to me based on data at the national level. That's the ecological fallacy, right? You cannot make an inference about a lower level of aggregation based on data at a different level of aggregation. If you want to make inferences at the individual level, you need to get individual data, not national level data. And the second one related to that 
as I mentioned before, is, I'm going to get to what this means, a, we also need to be careful with amalgamation paradoxes, or more commonly known, Simpson's paradox, which is a relationship that you see, a relationship that you see at a certain level of aggregation may be more vague or may disappear once you get to get to a different level of aggregation. And it may even reverse. This is a great example of an amalgamation paradox. Because once we start disaggregating the data by income level, for example, which is what I was doing over here, the relationship disappears. Right? There is no positive relationship. It's almost random, the relationship between one variable and the other variable. Uh, if we disaggregate the data even more at the regional level, at the local level, etc., the relationship, I'm pretty sure, will start you know, flipping, right? Once we get to the individual level, person by person, we could plot that through a survival rate chart, right? And we know that survival rates of people tend to be higher if we don't smoke, right? And if we smoke cigarettes in particular, our life expectancy is going to be substantially lower at the individual level, right? At the individual level. Finally, finally, the seventh challenge is what I would like to call moral blindness. What is moral blindness? Well, moral blindness is that, for some reason in the past few years, many, many people, we are all in social media, etc. For, for example, I'm in social media for sure, but for some reason we tend to believe that, or we dislike, when we are called out about our responsibility, about this, the, the information that we spread, publicly among our, 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 our networks, for example. Many of the charts that I showed you before, I have seen them retweeted, for example, mindlessly, right? I, for example, I, no, I'm from Europe, so I tend to like the idea of Obamacare, right? So if I see a chart uh, that shows that Obamacare is great for the job market, I feel prompted to, I will feel prompted to retweet it mindlessly. Oh, this chart confirms what I already believe, I will retweet it. That's what most of us do, right? We need to stop doing that. Because we all have a moral responsibility to improve the public conversation, and that involves controlling our impulses to spread information that we don't double check ourselves a little bit, or that we don't think about a little bit, a little bit carefully. In the past few years, by the way, there has been an increasing number of books related to what I like to call a sort of a revolution in public understanding of numbers, right? If you take a look at, for example, this slide, I'm showing six books, favorites of mine, about thinking about numbers for the general public. These are basically uh, several books that, um, a, 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 well, I included my own book over here, right? But, you know, let's focus on these ones over here. So, Naked Statistics, Bad Science, How Not to Be Wrong. Those are popular science books that are intended to teach the public, the general public, how to think critically about numbers. And I believe that that's fantastic. That's really, really great. What I miss in those books, though, is two different things. The first one is that they usually don't address charts which is a niche or a gap that I'm planning to fill with this new book that I'm publishing in the fall. But second of all, second of all, they really don't address, address this ethical or moral component of how we are all responsible for the information that we put out. And I believe that this is really important. Why? Because charts, and as an extension of charts, statistics, and as an extension of statistics, science, or the, the methods of science in general, those are tools. They are cognitive tools that we have developed to make us smarter, to extend our own brains, our own cognitive capacities. We have designed those tools in order to do that. In one sense, they are not different to a hammer. A hammer is also a tool that we have created to make us stronger, to extend our own arms, and to make us those arms stronger. And tools have an ethical dimension. There is an ethical component. We need to think about the consequences of the tools that we put out, or the consequences of the information that we put out. Because in the same way that a hammer can be used to build things, right? Charts and statistics, they can be used to build understanding or to enable conversations. But the exact same hammer or the exact same charts or the exact same techniques that we use to create charts and statistics, they can also be used to destroy that same understanding or to hinder the conversations, the very important conversations that we need to have in the future about important issues. So, we are all responsible, I think, for creating a better informational environment. If you are a specialist, a scientist, a data scientist, etc., you should read a little bit about ethics. It's very important to read a little bit about philosophy, ethics, etc., and ethical behavior, practical ethics, right? Google practical ethics. There are many very good books about that. 
practical ethics. Second of all, if you are not a specialist, you also have a responsibility if you're part of the public, right? Well, if you are a designer, a statistician, a scientist, a specialist, you obviously have the moral mandate, I would say, to just publish good information, to just publish charts that you have assessed, that you have double-checked, that you have verified, etc. But I was saying, even if you're not a specialist, a chart creator, even if you are just a reader of charts or a reader of numbers, we also, as readers, have also a responsibility. Readers, the general public, and this is a message that I hammer over and over again in the new book, readers in general also have the responsibility to curb our own impulse says, to retweet or to post in social media or to send to friends and family things that confirm our own ideological positions before verifying whether the things that we are sending are actually trustworthy or not. Thank you so much. Before I, by the way, before I, I finish this, I ask for permission for the organizers to do this, to make a little plug for a conference that I'm organizing. If you're interested in, co interested in computation, I guess that you all are, there is a conference coming up in UM in February, in early February, February 1st, the 2nd, called Computation and Journalism. So this is going to be a small gathering of computer scientists, programmers, statisticians, etc. on one hand, and journalists who work for places such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, etc., and many other news outlets to have a conversation about important issues, how artificial intelligence is going to change the, world, the way that we communicate, how predictive forecasting affects participation in elections, for example. There's going, to t there's going to be a talk about that. How data visualization can be better created, et cetera, and so on and so forth. So if you're interested in all these issues, please go to that website and sign up for the conference. I will be happy to see you there. And please you know, talk to me if you, are, if you attend uh, the conference. Anyway, thank you so much. It was a pleasure to talk to you today. All right, we've got time for one question. I see a hand up. Let's make it a good one. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent talk. So one reason a data visualization can be misleading is because the author of the data visualization makes it that way to, to make some point that the author wants to make. Um, on the other hand, the author of the visualization can just do a poor job, and it's, it's the person interpreting the visualization that is, comes to the wrong place. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any insight on which is more common in practice? And then, the, uh, the latter. The latter, the latter is more common, yeah. Okay. I, I don't have data to back me up on these, just an intuition. <laughs> but I think that is, well, go ahead, I interrupted you. Oh, it was, uh, I had another question, very easy question. Okay, you, so let, you, let me you, 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 had, you had a cool spotlight tool, what, instead of oh, a laser yeah. pointer, what, what is that? <laughs> People ask me about that. Let me address the latter question first. So this is, um, where did I leave it? This is called the Logi or Logi. I don't know how to pronounce it. Logic, Logitech, Logitech? Yeah, it's a Logitech. I, I don't know. I got this other day in Best Buy, and it's super cool. Right? I really like it. I feel like a Jedi you know, working with my. Anyway, um, so talking about the, the first question that you had. So uh, I think that it's more common to see charts that are created with the best intentions and they are, they are well designed. There is nothing wrong with the murder rate chart that I show you, right? It's only that you need to have some prior knowledge of the data in order to understand that chart correctly. So it's like a, there's a dual responsibility. There's a shared responsibility between the designer and the reader. The responsibility of the designer is to show the data as best as possible and to show a sufficient amount of data, right? So showing just a murder rate alone, the national uh, level, that's not a sufficient amount of data. You need to show more. But even if, I, if after showing a sufficient amount of data, people misinterpret that chart, it's usually because they don't pay attention to the chart. And one of the things that I, that I usually do in public talks and in the new book is, I say, is that I say, the first rule of be, for becoming a good chart reader is pay attention. Right? Don't assume that you can understand a chart by taking a quick look at it. Because a chart is, is like a piece of text. In order to understand it, you cannot just look at it. You need to read it. And you need to take a look at the source, and you need to take a look at the scales and the legend or whatever in order to interpret that correctly. So there's also a responsibility on the part of readers to become smarter, right? There's a wonderful, I don't remember the, the reference for these, but I recently read about a philosopher uh, that said, who said that we all have the responsibility to become smarter, right? To try to become smarter in order to participate in informed conversation. So again, it's a dual responsibility. The designer has more responsibility, obviously, but there's also a small responsibility on the part of the reader. <clears throat> um, thank you again. Well, thank you again. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>